Okay, well, thanks very much. And thanks everybody for joining us for our second day. Um, as you remember yesterday, we kind of covered the uh, pavement preservation and management and why it was a, a good idea to have some kind of a management system in place, even though it can be a really simple system to kind of be able to uh, look at your pavements and, and classify their condition. And also uh, we talked about a little bit of distress and distress identification from rutting and shoving, uh, crack, various types of cracking. Uh, um, and our distress comes from both the environment um, and also from, from load bearing from, from the traffic. So are there any questions or thoughts from yesterday that anybody wants to bring up or any, any, uh, any questions? This is a great time to unmute your button and and stump Brent. <laughs> so what do you guys got? Their coffee is still kicking in. Give them okay. <laughs> well, so anyway, what I want to do, you know, today is kind of transition into uh, potholes and cracks. Those are the real big uh, prevalent pavement killers. And then we'll get into various preservation type of treatments uh, to close ourselves out. So what we want to talk about and explore today is just some alternatives for repairing potholes. Um, we'll look at some options that are out there, maybe give a few ideas for uh, extensive patching of the pavement and look at the types of materials and methods that um, we can use for treating pavement cracking. What do you think of this picture? You have any roadways like this? I don't think it's a road I'd want to be driving down. <laughs> Yeah, no, it, it, it looks more like a, a residential type of roadway, but it's got some real drainage problems. You know? And so typically when we see a road like this, you know, we really think that there is a real water problem because water will seep in to the sub base. And remember, we talked about our layers yesterday. We had the pavement on the top, we had the base and the sub base down to uh, uh, an optional sub base and the original soil. But water will seep into the sub base either through cracks in the pavement on the top or, or from uh, water, standing water that's along the side of the roadway and it will seep in laterally. And those of you who, who have taken the Roads 101 workshop from me, we've talked about how water can get into the, into the sub base uh, through various means, uh, such as capillary action and so on. So if the water is improperly drained, you're really soften that sub base up and soft material underneath may shift or ooze to the side, leaving nothing to support the pavement or the hat of the, of the, the roadway on top. And so eventually it just kind of caves in and after a while, repeated beatings from the traffic and traffic loads and so on will cause the pavement to weaken, seriously crack and it will ultimately maybe start caving in and, and uh, potholes will start forming. So heavier loads than the pavement is designed to carry were also create this kind of condition, this potholing condition. So potholes are born just basically in a, in a sequence of events. A lot of times it's the precipitation and the water gets into the pavement and the sub base and down into the soil. We may have capillary action coming up from the bottom. Uh, we go through freeze thaw cycles. So if we've got some soils that are real prone to frost heaving, um, freezing will cause the soil to expand and it will work up against the pavement. Thawing then takes that action in reverse uh, where, the, the, where the soil will start to shrink and we might have a hole then under the pavement. And then the wheel load comes along and breaks it up and then we start into a pothole. So it's really important to use some high quality patching materials which are cost effective compared the less expensive products. But if we're in the middle of winter and we've got really cold temperatures, what must we do? Can anybody give me any ideas or thoughts? Or how do you handle potholes when you're in the dead of winter, when you maybe can't get uh, pavement 
road mix or you can't get um, uh, good asphalt to put back in. Any thoughts? Use the chat box or unmute and mm -hmm. talk about it. We have one. Uh, we have one answer that says bag asphalt. Okay. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, that's uh, kind of a cold mix that's sold by sold by various companies that you can get your hands on, and it'll actually work reasonably well during the winter. You know, it's not a, the end all be all, but it'll actually uh, help you patch the pothole. So, a couple yeah. more answers came in with cold mix uh, was one, and the other one was heated. Okay. Yep. Any other ideas on how you take care of winter patching? Yeah, so that, that can be a, a challenge. It really can be. Um, then if you lose, use um, lower cost materials and so on, sometimes it just ends up costing more because they don't last very long. And so we want to be able to place and not throw the material into the patch area because when we throw material into the patch area, it might, it might segregate the asphalt and aggregate can separate and you might not get a, a very good patch. And also it's, it's a good idea to compact every patch. And if you're doing a temporary patch, wheel rolling might work, um, but it's, it's, it's a good idea to be out there with some kind of compaction to make sure that the patch will stay. So high quality cold mixes, they do um, have carefully selected aggregate types and gradations. And we talked just a little bit about how we want to make sure and size, size the aggregate properly. And the clean and durable aggregates and the uh, sand mixtures are, are, are porous. There's very little sand mixtures that um, are real porous in nature. So, Sometimes with cold weather patching, um, polymer modified binder is a good thing to, to look at because it will hold things bet together better in the cold weather. And there are additives out there, and some of them are in a proprietary nature that are, is going to promote some good adhesion in the wet conditions. So one thing to think about if you're having trouble with cold patching, especially during the winter, is uh, maybe talk to other people that have used this type of, type of stuff and get their thoughts and see how they feel about what they're using, whether it's good stuff or not so good of stuff. So let's take a real close look at this picture and kind of ponder this for a moment. And let's ask the question, what's wrong with this picture? No right or wrong answers. Can you still hear me? Yeah, it looks like I don't think we've had any responses so far. Okay. You'd like to type in the into the chat box or you can unmute. You'd like to give some feedback on this picture. Yeah, just kind of take take a look and if you've got any thoughts. You know, there is some uh, we did have one response that was no tack down and unlevel asphalt. Okay, yep, that's one. The grade looks uneven. Um, and then another one said the compactor is in the trench and why not go to the side of the pavement? Okay. Any other thoughts? Okay, yeah, those are, received. yeah, those are all, those are all good thoughts, you know, and I, I would say that you probably got the wrong tool um, compacting the material, the, the base material that's in, in the trench there. It, um, you're better off, with, does anybody have any idea what you could do different with a compaction of this material? Any other tools that you would, other tools that you would use rather than this famous Ingersoll Rand roller? We had someone say plate compactor. 
Mm -hmm. yeah. A couple of answers. Yep. Yeah, that's a good answer. It's yeah, kind of plate compactors are probably more preferable than this Ingersoll Rand because even though it's a good roller and can be used in certain applications, this is probably not the best best application for this type of roller. You might not get the compaction that you desire throughout the entire patch area. So when we look at permanent repairs, we're very interested in patching potholes by digging out and repairing. And so we need to really identify the area that's affected. And as we talked yesterday, the type of cracking might kind of give us an indication as to how extensive of a repair we need. So as an example, if we have extensive alligator cracking, we've probably in all likelihood got something wrong with the uh, the base or sub-base material. And so we want to really stand back and take a look at the repair area and very important to really remove all the material to, to a, a sound material. So take a look at the area of not only the pothole, but the cracking that is associated around the pothole. And every pothole seems to have some extensive cracking around it. And look how far back that you have to go to dig it out to get back to sound material. And then we want to clean and tack edges. Somebody made a really good comment that we want to make sure and tack the edges properly and clean them. Place the patching mixture and we don't want to throw it in because we could be causing segregation and it would weaken our mix. But we just want to, we want to place it in the area that we're trying to patch. Compact it properly. Most people do use a plate plate compactor. Those seem to work really, really good and you can get into all the corners with it really nice and compact the mix appropriately. And then we want to check the level and to make sure we're level. Some, some believe that you have to maybe hump it up slightly because you might have some settlement. But uh, if we are compacting the sub base properly, sometimes when you hump it up, you'll get very little settlement and now you've got like a, a bit of a speed bump. And so it's probably best if we're, if we're compacting things properly to be able to put the mix in and just level it off real, real nice. So here's, here's an example of taking a look at the, uh, at the pothole and looking at the area that you'd probably mark out to really try to get back to sound material. So Usually, uh, and it's a bit of a judgment call in the field as to getting getting back to that sound material and some experience. But you know, it's a, it's it's pretty easy to do, and so most potholes are marked out in in a square or rectangular manner, um, and it's the pavement is then cut back to these boundary areas, and all the existing pavement is removed. And once you remove that, you can take a look at your sub base and see if you've got any, any water issues and how far down you have to dig to bring back the uh, sub-base with good material. So just a picture on being able to remove the failed materials. A lot of people will, will use a jackhammer, um, but I would be interested in knowing, um, so, some people uh, saw cut it with either a portable saw or you know, a, a big self-propelled type of saw. So I would be interested in, in knowing what you do. Do you jackhammer these out? Do you saw cut them? Looks like we've got several answers that say saw cut and hand saw. Okay. Yeah. And and it seems to be more and more that's what most agencies do. Do They uh, come in and, and saw cut for the patch. You get a really nice clean surface that you can tack back to. Uh, I'm seeing more and more that jackhammers maybe are going by the wayside and saw cutting is becoming more prevalent. I know many, many years ago that saw cutting wasn't in vogue as much as it is today. So um, I think for the most part, and I think maybe everybody might uh, agree, but if you disagree, that's fine. Uh, you can be sure and put something in the chat box. But probably saw cutting is is probably the preferred method.
So here it is, just a just another picture of, of digging down. Um, what do you think about this piece of equipment that they're using? Is it the right equipment? Too big, too small? Some of the responses have been it's too big. Uh, that's actually most everyone's response is that it looks too big. Yeah, it's kind of a bit unwieldy. So you know, you know, when you get something that's too big and it's kind of hard to manage or hard to control, you might not be doing a good job of, of digging things out properly. So again, it's important to kind of take a look at the, the equipment that you're using. But I also understand sometimes not everybody has all the equipment that's available to them. You just have to sometimes use what has been given to you. But we want to cut the faces and the, the, the faces should be straight vertical and get everything back to a good solid material. And we want to trim and compact the granular base or subgrade to establish that firm foundation. So after we get through excavating this out, we want to come back in with good material that we can compact well. Just wanted to show you this, this picture. Is there anything wrong with this picture? I was going to say, there's a lot of things wrong with that picture. <laughs> uh, let's see what others have to say. Go ahead and put your answer in the chat box or you can feel free to unmute yourself. One answer is need to cut asphalt back further. And another one is the edges uh, aren't clean or they're uneven. It's a pretty rough edge, holes under the joint and uneven compaction. Okay. Yeah, uh, you know, no, they are applying tack, which is good. We want to want to apply tack to the edge. You know? But yeah, note that the uneven face, and it looks like maybe a jackhammer might have been used when this uh, pavement was cut rather than a saw cut. So an uneven face sometimes kind of introduces another problem that we have and the fact that we might have a have a bad joint that we have to kind of deal with into the future. So it's a good idea. And, and again, I think saw cutting is becoming more prevalent to make sure we have a nice clean cut on the pavement. So then we want to backfill the uh, excavation with an asphalt mixture. Um, we want to shovel the patching material directly from the truck and place it to mix along the edges first. So work from the edges into the into the middle of the patch. And so this is a this is a device, I guess, for dumping asphalt mixture out of the back of a truck. Does this look familiar to anybody? Anybody use something like this? Yep, you're getting yes. <laughs> yeah. Looks like you can get one no. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it looks like you're just able to kind of dump it out of the back of the truck in some form or fashion rather than rather than shoveling it. So again, you know, some there's all kinds of various equipment out there to help us with patching. And so we want to we do want to spread the mix carefully, uh, rake it very carefully again to avoid segregation. So we've got a good well graded aggregate and it's really mixed well with the asphalt and we don't have big pieces separated from small pieces and we get a good patch that way. There it is, the mighty famous Wacker plate compactor and we want to compact each lift thoroughly. Do we typically, when we do patches, let me ask this question, do we typically take some kind of a density test of either the base material or patching material? Someone said, depends on the patch. Okay. Probably does mm -hmm. depend on the size of the patch and how much you want to get into it. Typically, when patching takes place, there's not a lot of lot of uh, density testing that takes place 
associated with the patch. You know, you go in and you just have, again, it's kind of a workmanship. You get a kind of a feel for how things are compacting, you know, and uh, it's a little bit of a, a little, you can't apply the science through density testing, but it's kind of a, basically, I think most people would agree there's a, there's a bit of an art to it too, once you get into it and experience. And so when you're able to dig the patch out like that rectangularly and take out all the bad material and, and, and bring it back with proper compaction equipment, typically you won't have a lot of problems in the future. And so it's probably a good idea to just take a final look at it, straight edge the patch, and make sure it's nice and smooth so when people drive over it, because remember the public, public uh, determines our quality by the feel of the seat of their pants. So, you know, after compaction, the surface patch should be flush with the adjacent pavement. And it shouldn't be humped up or, or depressed. And so once again, if, if, if we've done really good on digging out all the bad material and bringing everything back up in compacted lifts and do a good job on compaction, if we level the patch, it should be just fine. and We shouldn't have any problems with settlement. Anybody have this piece of equipment? It's kind of a blown in pothole filler. And if so, how does it how does it work for you? We've had some people that said yes that they do. Uh, okay. In, anybody brave enough to unmute themselves and tell me just a little bit about it? If you do have this yeah. equipment, do you like it? <laughs> do you not like it? <laughs> Somebody said it looks like the eighties. Uh, let's see. I haven't. I haven't seen any more yeses come through, but. Okay. Yeah, it's a Dura patch that's that's been around for a while. You know, um, the system uses the air pressure to apply asphalt emulsion and aggregate into um, large cracks and potholes himself. Would you, would you think of this type of, of uh, repair or using this type of machine, would this be along the lines of a permanent repair or a temporary repair? Some of the answers coming through say temporary. Yeah, I, I agree with that. It's probably temporary. Um, and the reason for, for that probably is that we're not going out and, and cutting away or cutting that square area to get back to sound material. So this is kind of a quick and easy, can be thought of probably as let's temporarily fix the pothole until we can come back maybe in better weather or better traffic control conditions. and. Uh, be able to square it up and dig it out and get back down to sound material. So here's kind of how it works. You know, the hole is cleaned with a high volume blower and blow out the uh, water and debris from the pothole. There's a opportunity then to spray a tack coat of asphalt that's applied to the area. And then that mixture of uh, Hot, hot asphalt and aggregate together fills the void. And you can see that the aggregate's on the truck and it's, it's mixed in some form or fashion with the asphalt. And then a finished coat of asphalt and you know the traffic is able to flow back upon this patch. But again, I would classify this probably as some kind of a temporary fix. So just some, some basic rules of thumb to kind of carry with us when we're looking at patching potholes. Um, try to dig out about one foot beyond the visible cracking or the, or the pavement distressed areas. Um, if you are using a jackhammer, it's better off not to rock the jackhammer. Perhaps you'll get a little better, better edge by not doing so. And continue to dig out and dig at least one and a half times the thickness of the failed asphalt concrete pavement. So if you've got like a two inch pavement, you would want to go one and a half times two inches and to continue just to dig down so you can get to good solid material. 
and use the proper compactor. And those plate compactors, I think, work pretty nicely for most patches where you can use compaction, compaction, and compaction. And if you do that and kind of pay attention to the layers and bring everything back up in layers, chances are you're not going to have to do any density testing and you'll get a pretty good solid patch. Okay. Any, any other thoughts on, um, on pothole, pothole patching? So I would like to go back just real quickly to this slide here. And I think this is really important that uh, you lay out that area to be patched. Um, oh gosh, I gotta be a little careful here, but you know, one, one um, agency, I guess, had the philosophy of just throwing mix in the hole and compacting it knowing that they would be back pretty soon to, to throw mix in again. And they weren't real wild about uh, cutting it out properly back down to sound material and patching it. And so as a result, they were just in an internal cycle all the time of patching potholes. Um, they said, well, we're out there keeping everybody busy, but really, if we don't cut it out properly and get back to sound material, you know, it could be just an ongoing cycle and we could be wasting some money. Any other thoughts on patching potholes? I don't see any responses right now. Okay. So, you know, potholes are around. They're, they're really never gonna go away because once we put pavement down, it starts to deteriorate the, from the moment we put it down. And uh, again, this is a good pavement preservation practice to get out there and um, cut, the pot, cut the potholes out and patch them back. So I wanna talk just a little bit about cracking and crack treatments. So it's really important to take care of those cracks when they first show up. And when we talked yesterday a little bit about our pavements and our, trying to get a condition survey, we looked at the various pavements and sometimes we'll find pavements that start with cracking and, and kind of hairline cracking. And it's good if we can take care of those early on on our pavement preservation curve and stay on the top end of that curve because it'll cost us less money. So if pavement cracking is left unattended, they're just gonna grow and they're gonna get worse and it's gonna quickly lead to more expensive pavement defects and more expensive repairs. So treating cracks, everybody has kind of their own idea. Crack treatments are used to prevent water and debris from entering the cracks in that hot mix plant mix pavement. And it's, and it's really interesting to me that you go out there and it doesn't take much of a crack. And sometimes if the cars aren't running on that certain section of pavement, weeds will start to grow. And you know, it's, it doesn't take much of a crack to have vegetation start to grow out from the cracks. So limiting water infiltration protects the underlying pavement layers and reduces the detrimental effects from freezing and thawing. Um, so sealing cracks is one of the highest priorities that we need to have for maintaining pavements. The first cracks will usually show up in a pavement through those, what we call either meat lines or joint lines when the pavement was put down. It comes from the cold joints because when the pavements are joined together, even though we try to do the best job possible to compact the pavement, you're still going to have a joined pavement, and that is the weakest part of the pavement. So a crack in the pavement allows for water to enter the base, and then this wet base softens, and it softens your subgrade. It just gets worse. Alligator cracking soon shows up, and as we saw in the previous pictures, uh, potholes will start to form, and the end result is we might have some real extensive damage to the pavement and the base. So water is the most destructive element in our pavement. So sealing the cracks do prevent the water from, from uh, entering the base and the sub-base. And these quotes actually come out of, it's called the Lone Star Roads Manual. It's a, it's a highway district and they put together a manual on crack treatment. They're trying to give some kind of idea as to what the biggest culprit is for cracks and if left untreated, 
what the results will be. So the roads and bridges that have cracked CO last longer than those that are not. That's been proven over and over and over again. So sealing prior to surface treatments and pavement overlays also enhances the treatment and further extends the pavement line as well. So I want to take a look at this, at this little chart here and kind of explain this just a little bit. If we look at the feasibility of the various pavement preservation treatments that we have, we can look at the distress type. And yesterday we talked about pavement distress, and it starts out with the fatigue cracking, linear block cracking, stable rutting, graveling, all those distress types that you see on the left-hand side of this little chart, flushing, bleeding, roughness, friction loss, moisture damage, and shoving. And so if we look at the feasibility of doing crack sealing, we say, what is the extent of the problem? And is it feasible or not appropriate? So if we take the, the second one down, linear block cracking, we think that crack sealing is, is very feasible when the linear block cracking is minor, uh, kind of minor to moderate. If we have real major block cracking or real major fatigue cracking, Probably crack sealing isn't the best choice. We've got something that the pavement is, is kind of distressed enough. It's gone through so much is kind of beyond the point of no return as far as being able to try to crack seal it. And you have to come up with some other kind of corrective or construction method that will, will help. So but when we look at the bottom one, the distress type of shoving, um, you know, crack sealing obviously is not going to help us with our shoving. So it's not appropriate. So just to kind of give you some idea as to if we can identify the type of distress of the pavement, we can then look at the feasibility of trying to do cracks in and is it gonna help us at all? Is it feasible or is it not appropriate? So it might be kind of a handy chart just to kind of, kind of uh, go over. If you're kind of new to this business, you can kind of take a look at it, use some judgment and, and see if, is, is crack even the right tool in the drawer or doing what I'm trying to do based upon the distress type of the pavement. So crack repair guidelines, um, just general rule of thumb, if the crack is eighth inch or, uh, or, or less and it's non-working, here are some of the treatment options. We can do nothing, okay? Maybe that's not a real super good option, but that is an option. We can put down some kind of a fog seal or we can kind of put down some type of a surface treatment or chip seal because these cracks are very, very minor in, in width. And so sealing them with, a, with some kind of a sealant is probably not real feasible. If they're between an eighth of an inch and three quarters of an inch, uh, crack filling is, is an option. Uh, we can use uh, crack sealing we might get a good service life from that crack sealing or maybe approaching five years. If we do, if a crack is three quarter inches or, or larger, probably filling those cracks with some kind of a sand emulsion slurry might be a good idea and patching where we might be able to, to kind of have to cut and replace the material would be maybe a good option for those larger cracks. Has anybody ever seen this? A lot of yeses. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen this myself and wondered about it. <laughs> yeah, and so, you know, the, the slide is on there and I'm not trying to be critical, but probably not a good idea to, you know, don't do this. Your, your pavement is shot as far as the distress goes and you're probably looking at using some other method to do some kind of a long-term fix. This might not give you the long-term fix that you need. Also, the motorcyclists will kill you. Motorcyclists hate this type of crack sealing. They call it tar snakes, and it really comes, becomes a bit of a safety issue. Would you agree or disagree with what the motorcyclist community is saying? I'm sorry, Brett, what did you say? Do you disagree or disagree with what? Yeah, would you? The motorcyclists do not like this at all. It becomes a real safety hazard for them. They call these right. 
and we've got a lot of complaints over the years. So mm -hmm. would you agree or disagree with the statement that the motorcyclists are making that this is okay. okay. A lot of people saying they agree. Yeah. Yeah. And especially if you ride a motorcycle that yeah, it is yeah. becoming a safety issue. And I'm so sure. as, as a result of this, if we're not using the right treatment, you know, perhaps maybe we're setting ourselves up to get into some kind of a liability situation. Um, Craig Schwab, one call, that's all. Maybe he'll be knocking on your door, wondering why you did this treatment and, and severely injured the motorcycle rider that he's representing. Also, has anybody experienced this? Wow. Mm. I haven't seen any responses come through, so got somebody said yes and then asked bleeding. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> somebody somebody else said all, all over North and South Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, we probably don't wanna we don't wanna do this either. So what do you think they're trying to solve here by doing this kind of patching or doing this kind of crack treating? Well, someone else commented that they had a leak. I don't know if, it, if... and then uh, answers coming through are saying rutting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're probably trying to trying to do a, a cheap fix on trying to maybe correct the correct the rutting. And this this doesn't work. Um, it it again it just opens you up to some liability. It creates a rough road. It looks like the, the material that's used is maybe over asphalted and you just kind of turn into a mess and, and the public doesn't fall madly in love with you. So. Anything wrong with this picture? Those of you who do crack sealing. Somebody said, missed some cracks, and why is the guy taking pictures? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wants to memorialize the job they're doing, I guess. Maybe yeah. <laughs> citizen, I don't know. But uh, anyway. Yeah, uh, there are some cracks that have been missed, you know. Um, but also kind of note that they're using those stri the strike-off tools, the proper strike-off tools. They're trying not to, you know, put the sealant out there to where it kind of humps up and, and causes a real wide problem. So, so um, yeah, they're trying. It's probably not a not a bad operation that they're doing there, as far as vaccinating goes. So the whole preparation, or the whole uh, trick to having successful treatment of, of treating cracks, is preparation. That's the key. We want to kill off the weeds in advance. It's amazing to me how vegetation will get in and grow even in some of the smallest cracks that are out there. And it's a really good idea then to clean that pavement surface. Um, you do want to provide for some pretty good traffic control and not run people over freshly placed uh, crack sealant um, because they get really angry when they want to have their cars repainted. And so we want to be able to clean the crack real well and remove any kind of organics that are in the crack, such as grass, moss, and so on. Um, need to dry the crack if necessary to, to really get it cleaned up. How many people here have ever seen or do you use or do you have a hot air lance? Response is yeah. Okay. We've got one that says we spray we spray crack sealant with DTAC. And yes that they have. Some others have saying they haven't seen it. So Okay. All right. Yeah. So if you're you're having a problem drying the crack, there's equipment out there such as this hot air lance that will will help you out. And so then you can fill in the crack with the proper seal and proper material, and then you maybe apply something to the surface of the seal to minimize the tackiness, so maybe um, traffic's not picking it up. So when it comes to try to apply something to keep it from being so tacky where traffic's not picking it up. Um, those of you who do crack sealing, do you apply something? And if so, what do you apply? I'm 
We haven't received any responses so far. Okay. And so oh, we got one. We got cold water and hand sprayer, and then okay. DTAC. Okay. Yep. That works. Sometimes just a little bit of a fine sand layer, maybe. Um, there, there was a school of thought once upon a time that you could apply toilet paper, but that didn't work very well. Believe it or not, that's a true story. So. And so the next step then, we want to clean and dry the clack. And for the best results, it's uh, cleaning with compressed air or sandblasting is a good idea. Hot air blasting it uses a heat lance to dry the crack will work very well because moisture is going to inhibit the bonding of the crack sealer to the wall of the crack. So the biggest thing I think for preparing the crack is to make sure that it's clean and dry before you put the material in. So I want to take a real quick survey here from everybody as to do you use a router to route your cracks before sealing them? So I'm going to go ahead and launch a poll so everybody can submit their answers. Okay. You should have it on your screen. You should be say you have answers of yes, no, and don't know. I'm getting a lot of no responses. Still waiting for some others to put their vote in. Got one yes. So it looks like the majority of people have said no. Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and we'll display the results. Okay. So good, good percentage said no. Okay, all right. Yeah, and you know, a lot of people don't route cracks. Um, if you've got cracks that are, that are bigger in size, um, sometimes routing them might be a good idea. You can use it on traverse and longitudinal cracking. You know, it, it involves using some kind of a pavement saw or router. This is kind of a specialized piece of equipment. And you want to create a reservoir that the sealant will go into and it's centered over the existing crack and then you fill the crack with sealant. Um, and so that we know when longitudinal cracks are sealed, especially on curves, tires may slip when traveling over the, the material that you've just put down. And this could be a bit dangerous. So routing the, the cracks um, probably has some advantages to it as far as being able to cut that reservoir for the sealant to sit in. And maybe the sealant is more flush with the pavement. Although, you know, routing takes, takes more time and it's, and it's labor intensive. And again, it's not used on every crack that's out there. It's used mainly on some of the cracks that are that are bigger. So, traffic needs to be rerouted until the uh, sealant material cures. Uh, if the pavement is to be open to the traffic immediately after sealing, we want to protect the sealant about against being picked up by the tires. And so, you can dust the crack with some kind of a fine sand, maybe some mineral dust or other some kind of similar material that's out there on the market. Uh, it's a good practice to work from the center line to the edge of the pavement to avoid backing into the stream of traffic. So bumps in overlays do not have to happen. You know, uh, so if we perform crack sealing at six to 12 months prior to an overlay, proper sealing application procedures and roller operation techniques can eliminate those bumps caused by too much sealant and and be applied to the crack. And again, blotting materials, dry sand's the best. Again, somebody has tried toilet paper. It's, it's uh, the research project said it was effective, but it's like, no, in my opinion, it's not. So again, just some general rules of thumb for uh, crack sealing. Um, for the linear cracks, only. Um, it's not intended for alligator cracking. You're just throwing good money after bad if you're trying to crack seal um, the alligator cracks. It's your pavement shot. It's, you're going to have to cut it out and uh, repel, repel, replace the pavement. We want to be able to clean the cracks. I can't emphasize that enough. We want, we want a really good clean surface that's dry. And so a heat lance will help us with that. 
Uh, don't overfill it with sealant. You want to avoid surface smears. Uh, you could introduce a, a hazard to traffic as far as, especially the motorcyclists. Um, and then if you're putting, putting sanding material down, uh, fine sand, you'll probably at some point want to sweep up that excess sand and, and get rid of it. So we already looked at the polling question. I think this is the one Lori put up there, uh, just the last one. Is that correct, Lori? Yes, that was. Yeah. Okay, so that was our, our polling question. So is there any, any thoughts on, on crack sealing? Anything that you want to offer to everybody else as far as what you find works good for you, uh, you know, best practices? Because you line up 10 different people and, and tell them to explain to you how they do crack sealing, and chances are you might get 10 different answers. So let's just open it up, take a few moments, and, and see if anybody has any thoughts that they would like to share on what is working good for you. If you'd like to go ahead and unmute at this point, you can go ahead and give feedback. We did receive one response in the chat that says we generally only crack seal before chip sealing. Okay. So let me ask this question. In your estimation, what is the best time of year for crack sealing? Spring, summer, fall, winter. Right now. Okay. <laughs> so we said right now, um, and I received an answer. It says fall. Somebody did say spring. Okay. In the cooler period. Okay. Thoughts on on why spring and fall are the best kind of season? If you could expand upon that, share with us. Colder weather opens up the cracks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Because we're dealing mainly with a flexible pavement. We established that early on and the pavement is going to expand and contract. And so you know, this time of year, probably ideal and more into the spring, because the pavement is contracted and will open, open the crack up to its widest, widest position. So, yeah. Any other, any other thoughts, any other best practices that anybody would like to offer up to the group? We're kind of all here to learn from each other. We did get a couple of responses in the chat. Uh, somebody said spring when it's not 100 degrees out. And Chris Owens had said that moisture content should be lower. And we received a response that says cools faster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all, all real good answers. All real good answers. So crack sealing can be thought of as probably one of the best preventative maintenance tools in our toolbox as far as being able to preserve the pavement from early stages on. Even if we get those hairline cracks, we'll want to try to treat them in some kind of manner. So, any other thoughts before we move on? Okay. Let's, let's go ahead now and talk about surface treatments. And so we're very interested in being able to treat the pavement surface. Remember in our previous section, we talked about potholes and cracks, and those are kind of isolated incidents on the pavement itself. So we're gonna correct certain portions of the pavement that has been distressed. But when we think about surface treatments, we're going to come in and we're going to treat the entire surface of the roadway, generally. And so we're interested really in kind of trying to investigate the different types of surface treatments that are out there and really where they're the most beneficial. And there's a picture of one of the most popular surface treatments, called chip sealing. And so what I would like to do is... Um, well, I'll, maybe I'll ask the question a little bit later when we get to it, as far as chip sealing goes. So just hold on for just a minute. But so surface treatments, the purpose is to, again, we want to seal cracks and we can get down with good surface treatments to seal those hairline cracks. We can't really 
as we found out a little bit earlier, it's not feasible for us to go in there and crack seal individual little tiny hairline cracks, but these surface treatments will seal all the cracks that are out there and especially those, those smaller cracks. It's surface treatments will help us by waterproofing the surface because water will come down from the top into the, into the roadway uh, mix into the asphalt. It's a porous material and we'll get into the, get into the base. So it's a good idea to waterproof it. We have an opportunity through various types of surface treatments to improve the fit friction of the surface of the roadway. So it'll help cars stay on the road and help cars when they're trying to stop. Uh, surface treatments can improve ride quality. A little bit iffy on that because we're not putting down like a, a big uh, thick plant mix overlay where we get the most uh, surface uh, ride improvement, but it can improve the ride somewhat. And we are able to rejuvenate the surface or combat against oxidation. And, and again, oxidation is, is an environmental thing that uh, is caused and oxidation starts from the moment you put the pavement down. So there's various types of surface treatments that are out there. Fog seals are used. Um, some use them fairly extensively. Slurry seals are used. The biggest one that is used by far out there from most agencies is the chip seal. Uh, we'll talk about the cape seal. I don't see that being done a lot, but we'll look at it and see if that's something that is of interest to you. And then um, we'll talk about a scrub seal. So when we think about fog seal, it's a light application of diluted, slow setting asphalt emulsion, emulsion, okay, without any kind of aggregate cover. Some of the advantages to a fog seal, it does seal the pavement. It's a uh, real, real kind of inhibit rattling by kind of gluing things together. Um, if a pavement is heavily oxidized, it will rejuvenate that pavement and combat oxidation. And it really kind of, provide some kind of a delineation if you've got uh, a shoulder out there that you're trying to de delineate. Also, fog seals might give us an opportunity to then come back with uh, pavement markings if we want to re restripe the roadway in a different manner. Maybe a fog seal might, uh, might allow us to have a clean canvas to work from. So again, some of those benefits of a fog seal it will seal the small cracks and surface voids, which is good. Um, when those, most people put down chip seals. Um, and what I'd be interested in knowing is, and I don't have a polling question on this, but if we could just kind of kind of chime in and take kind of a little bit of an individual poll here or, or off the cuff poll. How many people here, how many agencies um, fog their chip seals. Once their chip seals go down, you put a fog coat on top. I'd be interested to know. Like, a lot of people are saying no. There's one that said that they do. Okay. All right. Yeah, some... Yes. Some agencies do, some agencies uh, don't. I know, I can tell you from at the transportation department, years and years ago, we used to never fog seal our, our, our roadways or our chip seals. We had a lot of chip seals that were starting to fail and we found that investing in a fog seal helped put the chips in place. We also had to go through quite an educational uh, experience with chip seals as far as the amount of oil that we're putting down. I'm going to cover that just a little bit later on. So some of the benefits, it does prevent uh, the rattling of, of chip seals. I know here in Boise, the Ada County Highway District, uh, in Ada County, they do fog seal most of the chip seals they put down. And it does prevent snowplow damage. It can, it can help with that as well. And it just darkens up those new chip seals. Uh, and so if you're putting down pavement markings, on the new chip seals, you can get some really good delineation from the pavement markings seem to pop out at you and stand out a bit better off. So you might 
be um, introducing some enhanced safety for people who are driving, especially at night. So let's look at our little feasibility chart here again. So those of you who might be new to business, you can take a look at this. And again, we've got those various distress types of the pavement down the left-hand side, all the way from fatigue cracking down to shoving. And so we think about chip seals, you know, if the extent of the problem for say fatigue cracking is minor, a chip seal is feasible. Uh, rutting, and of course it makes common sense that it's not appropriate to try to solve rutting it can help us with raveling, it can help us with um, maybe a little bit of roughness, and certainly help us with moisture damage. So you kind of get an idea from a fog seal, from a feasibility standpoint, if we apply it to these various distress types in the, in the pavement, what it will or will not do for you. So it is one of the least expensive tools that is out there. And it's also kind of one of the, the, the least used as far as um, uh, treating the surface of the roadway. So we want to be able to clean the roadway surface. Uh, it's very important to really start with a good clean surface. If we don't have that, this fog seal won't stick. So clean it, clean it again. So brooming, a good, good stiff broom usually takes care of that. We want to provide for good traffic control. We don't want people running on a fresh fog seal. It kind of messes up their car. Spray the asphalt, the liquid asphalt down, and then allow for cure time. And in some instances, not always, but some instances, you might have to blot, especially if you put down the fog seal a little too thick. So again, there was our polling question. That's the one I was looking for. Does your agency fog seal? So let's just go ahead and run this poll question even though we took our informal poll. Getting a lot of answers in already. <laughs> All right. Good. Got quite a few answering, so we'll go ahead and end the poll and display the results. Okay. You had a good mix. Yeah, that's a that is a pretty good mix. Um, yeah, I'm surprised a little bit surprised that 35 percent of you say yes that you do that. I thought that my answer might be a little bit less than 35, so that's good. So I find that people agencies are kind of more and more uh, seeing the benefits of fog seals, especially when they use them in conjunction with a chip seal. But putting down a fog seal is really relatively inexpensive, but it will help you with those minor cracks and that, that hairline cracking that's only going to get worse over time. So we've been sitting here for an hour now. So um, let's go ahead before we get into slurry sealing and take like maybe a five minute break. Would that work for everybody? So another, another surface treatment that is out there in our tool bag is a slurry seal. Some some have used this um, with some fairly good success. And a slurry seal basically is just a, a well-graded aggregate, you know, an aggregate that has got uh, coarse particles and fine particles. It's usually on the smaller side. So the aggregate has to be closely manufactured and, and sized through sieve analysis to make sure we have good quality aggregate. And it's mixed with a slow setting asphalt emulsion. And so, Slow setting asphalt basically takes just longer to cure. That's about all it means. It does provide a hard wearing surface um, for our pavement preservation, and it does a pretty good job with sealing the cracks, especially those small, small hairline cracks. So the whole idea behind a slurry seal is to go ahead and seal those raveled pavements that are aged and starting to exhibit cracking. Um, and it will take care of the, the, the fine cracks as well. And so it will help correct that oxidation and it also helps correct graveling. Um, it will fill bind our surface irregular, irregularities. Um, and it does have some properties to restore some friction to the roadway. So there's some safety value with the slurry seals. We typically find slurry seals, they will be applied to highways, but you'll typically find them maybe in residential streets 
a lot of private owners of big parking lots will use a, will use a slurry seal to help seal up their pavements uh, and cracks and help preserve their pavements. And you can actually kind of get this stuff and apply it to driveways. So you do have some private owners that apply it to driveways. So again, when we look at our feasibility and kind of compare that back to fog sealing, we see that we get a little bit more of an extensive uh, fix to a lot of our pavement distress types. So again, looking at the left-hand side, we, have, we identified yesterday what the various distress types are in our pavement. And you can see that uh, feasibility, if we take just an example of friction loss, we can see if we've got a minor problem or a major problem with friction loss that a slurry seal will help us across the board. Will certainly help us if you've got minor or moderate uh, rattling. And so again, this is just kind of a guideline or rule of thumb. If you're trying to uh, solve some of your distress types, you can take a look at what your distress type is and ask yourself the question, Maybe will slurry seal work for me? So again, some of the keys for a slurry seal, um, it does use an emulsified asphalt and a, and a smaller sized aggregate. It's mixed, it's kind of a, it's a one-stop shop as far as this whole application process goes. It's all kind of mixed in a, in a pug mill. It's a mobile pug mill, We're mixing this all together. And then it's literally, as we see in the picture here, let's back up, it's literally squeegeed into the roadway. And I kind of like the guy on the left-hand side, he's even got his hand squeegee out there just to kind of make sure it gets applied properly across the roadway. Um, and so it just goes down the road. It's, it's very um, important, like all pavement uh, preservation methods are to have a good clean roadway surface to begin with. Um, this work is usually performed under a road closure. You don't want traffic running around on this. It does take a little bit of time to cure out and, and turning movements and turning traffic will tend to destroy the slurry seal before it cures. And then you come in and you just simply apply the, apply the slurry seal. So, the claim to fame is it maybe has an average life of five to 10 years. Uh, I kind of, kind of question whether you're bumping up towards 10 years if, if that's the surface service life, but some people claim they can get 10 years out of these things. Um, if you have a lot of major cracking, so say thermal cracking or transverse cracking, you probably want to uh, go ahead and seal those larger cracks before you apply the slurry seal. And again, it's, it's important that when you repair those cracks, to make sure the sealant goes in and it's flush to the pavement. And it does require a very clean aggregate. You can't have dirty or dust coated aggregate particles because it just won't stick and it won't work very well. So let's go ahead and throw up a polling question. Uh, slurry seals are out there. I don't know how commonly they're used, but we're about to find out. Does your agency use a slurry seal? Actually, Brent, I apologize. I don't think we had that one entered in. So if people want to go ahead and put their answers into the chat box, or you can feel free to unmute. Okay. Yeah. Your, I know we'll have to double check these polling questions next time. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Yeah, so I'd like, I'd really like to know, really, because it doesn't seem it to be quite as popular, but how many of you do use a slurry seal? If you just I'm the chat seeing box. a lot of no's coming through. Um, there was one don't that they don't know, but looks like most of the responses coming through are saying no. Yeah, and that's that's probably why what I would expect. Um, I don't think a lot of people do use a slurry seal. Um, they can be a bit time consuming. You do have to have good traffic control. Or you have to have a manufactured product. Um, it might be some of it might be a bit proprietary. And you're typically going to have a contractor do this work for you because they've got some specialized equipment. So, yeah, if I had to answer, I would say most people probably do not. But again, it's one of the tools out there in our toolbox that can, that can help us in certain situations. Here's everybody's popular. Let's go ahead and talk just a little bit about chip seal. Okay. And it is, it's really is one of the oldest um, methods for preserving the roadway surface, and it's used pretty successfully when it's done right. And so let's open it up just a little bit, uh, uh, just kind of ponder this question. 
do you believe that chip sealing is kind of more of an art or more of a science? In other words, you have to kind of get a feel for doing this, or is there just exacting methods that you do use to apply a chip seal? Looks like a lot of people are saying both. A mix of both. You're right. It is, it is both. Uh, chip seals can be our best friend, or it can be like the construction method from hell when it goes wrong. Um, and I'll talk about that in, in just a moment. But it is an application of asphalt and aggregate to the existing pavement. So let me ask this question. I'd really, really like to know, uh, because it's, real, it's a real mix out there. How many of you do your own chip seals, and how many of you contract this out? I should have asked a point question on this. But if you could put something in the chat box or open your mute out and comment on that, I'd really like to know. Seeing, well, seeing a lot of they do it on their own, but I did see uh, one that says they contract it. It's like majority so far have been they do it on their own. Couple contracts. Okay. Well, th those of you who do it on your own, I really applaud you for doing that because I think you get the best quality of the chip seal because it is both an art and a science. And it just takes experience to go out there and, and do a good chip seal. Uh, many, 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 many years ago, ITD did their own chip seals. Uh, they got out of that business. Um, and if we've got any contractors that are listening in today, I'm not going to offend anybody, but you know, the contractors believe that they needed to take advantage of some of this work. And so many, many, many years ago, they kind of got involved and ITD got out of the chip sealing business. And I, I think that just like anything else that, you know, quality can become an issue. Most do a good job, but sometimes you get some that, that don't, but you're kind of at the mercy of that low bid. So those of you who do your own, own chip seals, um, I applaud you for that effort. I think you did a pretty good job. Uh, I know Ada County does their, their own and they, they seem to in an urban environment uh, do a pretty good job. But let's face it, chip seals, the public is not madly in love with you when you do chip seals, but um, it is one of the best methods for preserving the pavement. So the whole purpose is to do pavement preservation and, and rehabilitation. It does a very nice job of sealing the pavement. Uh, and if you've got pavements that are oxidized, it will rejuvenate those. And to a certain extent, they'll retard reflective cracking on hot mix asphalt overlays. So that's another, another benefit. Uh, you certainly do improve the road friction and the skid resistance. Um, that's a, another big benefit. Um, and then you also have an opportunity to have a fresh canvas. And what I mean by that is if you're having some real uh, pavement marking problems and you want to restripe the roadway or reapply the pavement markings in a different manner, you'll give yourself a nice clean canvas and you can reapply the pavement markings that will maybe fit your roadway a little bit better. So as we look at our feasibility, again, we can, we can see that um, it's pretty feasible to apply chip seals to many of our distressed types of pavement and if in the area of friction loss and linear uh, and block cracking and raveling. It looks like we get, uh, get quite a bit of, of bang for the buck, if you will. It's pretty feasible to put it down. In most minor distress situations, uh, and there's a few of them that you can where you can solve your problem when your problem is of a major major extent. So, so chip seals basically just a spraying of emulsified asphalt on an existing surface or or an aggregate is placed, and so again. We want to be able to prepare the existing surface and go in and do that good patching. If we've got some pothole problems, you know, cut everything back to sound material as we looked at earlier. Uh, do some a good job of crack filling if we've got major cracks that we need to need to take care of, and really clean the existing surface of the roadway. We want a nice clean surface to begin with to get the, the best job possible. So let me ask this question real fast, and let's use the chat box if you can. Is there anybody out there who does not do any chip seating on your roadways? 
just curious. No responses so far. Okay. So yeah, I almost I almost draw the conclusion that you know most everybody does chip seeding, and it is it's a it's a it's a good uh, preservation technique that's fairly inexpensive. So some of the things kind of maybe goes a, a bit without saying that uh, you need to provide some really good traffic control for chip seals. Um, when you do spray the emulsified asphalt, you want to have it uh, come out in a very calibrated manner. So you got to have good calibration for your equipment so you know exactly how much emulsified asphalt you're putting down. You want good calibration when you're applying aggregate from the chip spreader. And some of these chip spreaders today are pretty sophisticated as far as being able to control the, to control the uh, application rate. Um, you want to be able to roll and seat the chips with pneumatic rollers and at some point in time sweep the loose rock. And so my, my question is, um, if you can convey something in the chat box, do you leave the, leave the rock on the roadway and you, and, you, and you wait a few days to sweep it or do you sweep it through the roadway right away? In other words, you put the chip seal down and boom, you're out there with the, with the brooms in a very short time, or do you let it just sit there for a while? So far, I've got one response that said leave it, that they leave it. Got a, two, uh, a couple of those, and then some said a day or so. Leave for a couple of days. Okay. Yeah, it just kind of depends on the highway. If you're on a high speed, kind of rural highway, um, and you, you seeded the chips well, a lot of times people like to sweep the rock because. Unfortunately, one of the hazards with chip sealing is paint damage and windshield damage to cars. You're faced with that. Um, but in urban settings, such as Ada County Highway District, I know here in, in Boise, they'll put their chip seals down and they'll leave the loose rock. Um, it, they don't have people that fall madly in love with them because of that. It's, it's kind of a nuisance and kind of tracks all over the place, but I think it gives them a good job in the uh, urban setting because it really allows those chips to seat down really well in the, in the asphalt. And then they'll, they'll come in and, and pick up the chips with, with pickup brooms and actually do some rescreening and, and reuse of those chips. Uh, it is said that the typical life of a chip seal is about seven to 12 years. I kind of like to think that seven is probably the better end of the scale rather than 12. Um, and I know that that many agencies have kind of adopted their in their operational philosophy that they'll come in and chip seal about every seven years. So there it is, a picture of a typical chip seal going down. Trucks are backing up into the into the hopper of the of the spreader. Um, the, the rollers are up pretty close behind the. Uh, the uh, chipper. So that looks like a fairly good operation. One of the things that I wanted to talk about was emulsified asphalt. And just so people know, emulsified asphalt is water and oil mixed together. But what happens when you mix oil and water? Does it mix up real well? Chances, chances are it does not. So emulsified asphalt is manufactured and it goes through a process called a colloidal mill, where it literally shears at a molecular structure, it shears the molecules of the asphalt and the water, and then it recombines, and it kind of recombines in the water and the asphalt stick together. And as long as it's heated and it stays in suspension, it'll remain that way for a while. But once it comes out of the, um, out of the spray bar, and hits the roadway, then it starts to cool, and you can see that the water starts to evaporate, and the emulsified asphalt then starts to break, and it goes from a gunky-looking brown to a, to a, to bl to black. And so, it's very important to recognize when this asphalt starts to, in the term, is typically break, as to when you put the chips down. So you want to put it put them down to where they'll seat in real well into the emulsion and then the water starts to come off and then the asphalt appears and starts to harden and you've got the chips that are well seeded. If you put down the chips too late, 
you can't get them embedded into the asphalt. Uh, so some rules of thumb for chip seals. Uh, we don't want to use on bleeding or rutted pavements. Uh, so we want to correct those bleeding and rubber pavements ahead of doing chip seals. Um, we can pre-fog seal any new patches. It's kind of a good idea, but you need to let the fog seal cure out. Very important to use clean aggregate, clean chips. Uh, dirty chips uh, will not stick to the emulsified asphalt as well, and you'll have some raveling problems. Certainly want to apply that in warm weather, and you'll have typically some type of a surface temperature specification. Um, I know year, years ago out on Interstate 84, ITD tried a new asphalt that was sold to us that would work well in low temperatures. It was heavily rubberized and it did not. We made the six o'clock news, but they never cured out. Um, and in fact, ITD had to come in with their road graders and scrape graders and scrape all the asphalt off to the side. And this stuff was so sticky, it would stick to the tires of the grader. And when the grader spun their tires, this stuff would actually separate from the tire and then it would stick right back to the tire. It was weird looking stuff. Anyway, we, the, the public really came unglued and we had quite a few claims. So we want to go ahead and spread the chips immediately behind the emulsion spray so we can get some good seeding action. And then we want to roll slowly. Uh, a rule of thumb has been rough, operate the rollers at a walking speed. Some people, walking speed is typically like three miles an hour, but it's hard to keep up with production. So many times people find themselves, they're, they're using their rubber tired rollers at maybe five to seven miles an hour, which seems to work pretty good, you know, and then you can keep up with some good production rates with that. You don't want to run the rubber tired roller like you're at the Indianapolis Speedway because you want to get good seating. So I think I kind of already asked this. I don't know, worry if you've got this polling question, but if we could put this up, if you've got it. There you go. So if you could answer this, I kind of I kind of already asked it ahead of time, but let's go ahead and answer this plain question. Does your agency chip seal? Looks like we've got almost everybody that's responded. So go ahead and share the results. Yep, and that's that's kind of what I would expect that most everybody does chip seal. I see there maybe is, is one or two that maybe does not. Um, again, chip seals are, it's the, a blend of art and science. Um, if things go wrong, typically it's the um, asphalt, the, the rate of asphalt that's being put down the emulsified asphalt. Uh, we had one experience, we had a few inspectors, we had to go to educational school and it's not a crime to up the oil, up the oil application rate if you need to to get proper seeding of the chips. And this inspector at ITD says, nope, it, the contract says it's, it's going to be at this certain rate, and this is the only rate we're going to do. And they knew, and the contractor was trying to tell them that these chips are not going to seed because we have absorptive aggregate that is absorbing the emulsified asphalt. And sure enough, we had a real horrible time. And so one of the worst things that can happen is if you put down too little asphalt and you don't get good seating, the chips will immediately come up, especially in high speed traffic. And boy, oh boy, here come the claims and we bought a lot of windshields. So don't hesitate to kind of maybe play with it. If you're putting down the oil and it just doesn't look right, the art and the science coming together is up the asphalt content a little bit. Uh, you can also always lower it back down to make sure you get that right. Are there any questions? I kind of want to pause here and, uh, and see if anybody wants to share any of their experiences with Chip Seal, or do you have any best practices that you'd like to offer up to the benefit of the group? Um, just take, take a moment or two and kind of think about that. And if there's anything you want to offer up, um, feel free to unmute yourself and tell us about it. Any good horror stories? <laughs> I figure someone's got to have one out there somewhere, right? <laughs> yeah, usually. 
Oh, I haven't seen anything in the... Well, I got one comment from the chat box that it's good to have a good oil truck driver. Yes. I'm glad whoever said that. I'm glad you brought that up. Because, Thanks, Paul. <laughs> yeah, that does make a big difference. If, if somebody who knows how to operate the distributor. Um, somebody else said that they had a truck get hung up on the chipper box. Okay. That's always not so nice. You have to kind of stop everything and unstick the truck. Yeah. yeah so again, I think that I think that those that do their own chip seals, I, I think they enjoy a pretty good, pretty good quality. There is art and science and you do have to experiment a little bit with it. Um, so I applaud those who, who do their, their chip seals. So I want to talk just a little bit about tape seal. We'll have to move along here. And a cape seal is nothing more than a combination of a chip seal followed within a few days by some kind of a slurry seal or microsurfacing treatment. Okay. So if cape seals are more expensive to put down, but if you're concerned about a rough ride, it will produce a, a smoother finish for you and produce uh, less road noise. Cape seals can be used and are commonly used where they are used in, in city streets. And they are more durable than a slurry seal because it's kind of a, a double whammy. You get the combination of that chip seal with a slurry seal on, on top or some kind of microsurfacing. So just a little bit of a a little bit of a picture. You can see the the first surface, and then you've got the second surface that's darker in nature. Um, uh, that's it's just like kind of the name denotes. It's a cape that kind of covers your first surface treatment. So if you're putting down the seal coat, and you're coming back with this microsurfacing or slurry seal, it'll seal back over it and help to hopefully give you a little bit of a smoother pavement. So just like the name says, it's a cape that you're throwing over your first treatment. Kind of a little picture as to what a cape seal looks like. The existing substrate is, well, it's nothing more than the existing pavement. You've got some kind of a, a, a tack coat. In this, type, in this case, it's like the emulsified asphalt. And you've got the seal coat rock that goes down, which is denoted by the word stone. And then you've got some kind of fog spray um, again, this is the a slurry seal or, or some kind of microsurfacing treatment. And it fills in those voids that are between the larger stones that were put down by the, um, by the chip seal. And so the whole idea behind this is that you get a really durable um, preservation of your pavement surface. And it, excuse me, it produces a little bit of a, of a um, smoother ride. So let's throw up this question. I'm really interested to know, do you use a cape seal? Getting some responses. All right, looks like we have a good majority of the responses. I'll share the results. Okay. Yeah, and this this answer doesn't surprise me at all because cape seals are are not widely used at all. They tend to be more expensive. They are pretty durable, but you pay for that durability. So this is kind of the probably about type of answer that I would expect to expect to get. So and and in fact I very rarely, I, it's, I haven't seen very many cape seals over the, over the years I've been picking out the planet. So another surface type of preservation is a macro seal. Um, it uh, is kind of an open graded uh, cold mix type of asphalt. So you put this thing down by applying liquid asphalt and kind of a single graded aggregate. So you don't have a well-graded aggregate. You use kind of this one size of stone or rock. Um, you do have some fines, though, that you do introduce into it. And there are some other additives that can be proprietary in nature. 
that go into this, this process. It's a single machine is applied, so you've got to have a specialized piece of equipment to put down a macro seal. So these are typically done by specialized contractors. Um, and it eliminates basically the distance between the distributor and the, and the chip spreader. So the asphalt goes down and boom, right behind the asphalt is the chip spreader. It's kind of a one-stop shop. And you do tend to get the same results as a chip seal, but they are more expensive kind of put down. Um, they do provide a good hard wearing surface. Um, there's, there's an opportunity to reduce the noise that is produced in your pavement, as well as reduce that, uh, that crack reflectivity. Um, so a little bit of a, a surface improvement, uh, surface profiling will be improved. And you can sometimes restore the texture to some flushed pavements. And what I mean by flushed pavements is it's a bleeding pavements. So asphalt is bubbled to the surface. Sometimes a macro seal will, will help restore that texture to that smooth surface that's caused by bleeding. So here's what it looks like with the equipment going down. If we take a look at that picture to the left, you can see the asphalt coming down. And then you can see the chips and the spreader box right behind it. These things, I don't think, lend themselves very well to high production rates. Um, I think it's, it's pretty limited as far as production because it's a kind of a one-stop shop and you got to have, you know, the aggregate coming in at some point in time. Uh, uh, the asphalt's on board. So I, I don't see macro surfacing. I have seen it in some urban environments and it seems to work pretty well. But again, you have to have this, this specialized equipment to do it. So it is a small application of that sand or small sized aggregate. It tends to use, use a lot of smaller aggregate. Um, it's on a broomed layer. Typically it's a polymer modified asphalt. So you get stickiness, so plasticized asphalt. Um, you can fill small cracks and voids pretty nicely with this process. Um, it will help you with oxidized pavement like many of our surface treatments do. And you can put this down first in preparation for another treatment. So if you want to put this down to try to try to fill cracks, small cracks, I don't know, try to maybe true up the roadway just a little bit prior to another surface treatment, you can certainly do this um, macro surfacing. Okay. I'm sorry, I transitioned to scrub seal. So uh, the things I just described apply to a scrub seal. So I guess my question is, and let's use the chat box, is does, has anybody ever done any macro surfacing? Kind of one stop shop with a specialized machine. Seeing some no responses right now. Getting a lot of them now. <laughs> yeah. Most people are saying no. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, and, that, and it's been my experience that not a lot of people will use macro surfacing. So let's talk about scrub sealing. I'm a little ahead of myself here. So scrub seal is basically just the application of a sand or a small sized aggregate, and it's on a, that broomed layer of polymer modified asphalt. And you can fill the small cracks and voids quite well and help with oxidized pavements. And, and you can put this down in preparation for another treatment. Okay. So the asphalt is applied by a distributor. Right there, and the asphalt is then basically scrubbed, literally scrubbed into cracks and, and surface defects. And then the sand is then applied over this asphalt and scrubbed into the cracks and surface again. And then it's all rolled with a pneumatic roller. Here's a picture of a scrub seal. Let's just take a moment and take a look at this. This is uh, like you can see the distributor on the front of the picture here. And then you can see these brooms that's literally scrubbing the asphalt into the pavement and then the sand layers applied behind it. Um, we had, uh, I, I gave this workshop a little earlier in another part of the state and somebody actually tried this scrub sealing technique on a, on a test section of roadway and it did not go well for them. Uh, it was a really kind of ended up in their story anyway was it was kind of a goopy, gloppy mess. Um, a lot of the asphalt ended up going off the roadway. 
Um, they had a hard time putting the sand down. It just was really, really turned into a bit of a messy operation. They did have to agree that if you've got a lot of small cracks in nature by scrubbing this stuff in, it did take care of, of sealing those cracks. But they, they, there's something that they said that they would not use it again. So just an FYI, there's another, another picture of a scrub seal train. You can see the, the scrubber brushes and then the uh, distributor comes by, the chip spreader comes by and puts down a, a layer of fine particles such as finely graded sand. So if we look at our feasibility scale, if we're looking at trying to correct some kind of our pavement distresses that are listed on the left-hand side there, we can see that it might work if we have a, if we're combating raveling, friction loss, roughness, some moisture damage, and certainly will help in fatigue and block cracking. But again, it, it is kind of a specialized process. You have to have this specialized equipment. And for, the, for the people that I've talked to that's tried to do scrub sealing, it, sometimes it has not gone very well for them. I'm not trying to knock the scrub sealing industry, but it's just, that's the report that I get from some that have tried to use this process. So let's just throw this up real quick, if we can. Answer the question, does your agency scrub seal? So we're getting a lot of no's. Uh, we had one that said yes. There was a uh, one that, uh, or a couple of people said that they tried it on a, I don't know if it was a scrub seal or it might've been the one before that, that they did it on a bike path. It looks like we've got almost everybody answering. So I'll go ahead and share the results. Okay. So yeah, just about everybody has said no, and that's, that's not a big surprise. So. Yeah, it had, has been used. I'd be interested to know, you know, when they, when they did it, though the person or persons who use the scrub seal, what was your uh, experience with that? Did it work well for you or would you ever do it again? I don't know if you are brave enough to unmute and give us your thoughts. It's <laughs> quite group. <laughs> and if you don't have access to the microphone, you can always type it into the chat box. We're not getting a response. I, yeah, I guess I would just ask the question. I guess the simple question is, would you ever entertain using a scrub seal again if you tried it once? Scrub seals are not, scrub seals are not real popular. Any questions at all? Let's just kind of pause here for just a moment. You know, we've talked a lot about the uh, pavement preservation. We can think of along the lines of our pavement preservation kind of covered isolated spots like repairing potholes and repairing cracks. When we've talked about the preservation system to where we're applying some kind of a treatment over the entire roadway. Any thoughts or comments, best practices? Let's just take a moment here and kind of reflect upon that. I'm not seeing anything in the chat box as of right now. So we, we've kind of established through our polling and in our conversations so far that chip sealing is by far the uh, most popular methods for preserving our pavements. Um, they've been tried and true. They work really well over the years. It's, we've established that it is a combination of art and science. We're not building the moon lander. So it does take a little bit of experience to put them down. And those who do their chip seals on their own have learned from this experience and they generally get a pretty good job. So I just want to kind of talk just a little bit as we kind of are thundering here towards the end about chip seal construction. Hey Brent, before yeah. you go on, we did have one question. Yeah. It says that we purposely mix 10% sand with our chips. Have you ever heard of this? No, I really haven't. So when you put your chips and you just mix them, do you kind of, you mix them in a, 
a kind of a pug meal or you just kind of mix them in the pile? And what was your results? What were you trying to achieve? Were you, you trying to gain uh, the chips to stay down better or fill the cracks or voids with the chips? That came from Mackenzie. So I don't know, Mackenzie, if you can unmute and give your feedback or if you'd like to put it in the chat box. Yeah, I've really, I've really never heard of that. That's interesting, though. There's no response as of yet. So. Okay. Well, if you happen to happen to think of that or would like to respond, we can certainly pick up on that. But I'll, let me go ahead and press on. We're starting to get towards the end here. So I just want to talk just a little bit about chip seal construction. And so, you know, let's think about how we set up for a good ship seal and that we in investigate that equipment operation and what it takes to have good field inspection. And what are some of the common problems and possible solutions that are associated with ship seal construction? So we want our proposed materials to be of sufficient quality. We want the, the chips that are manufactured to have good angularity, good angled faces. We want, to be, we want it to be sized properly. Um, we can determine that through sieve analysis. Um, we want to make sure that we have a proper amount of cover of aggregate and the bituminous binder. In this case, it's, uh, it's emulsified asphalt. Um, um, there's a method called the McLeod method for designing ship seals. Some people use this to help determine the, the amount of asphalt, the asphalt rate put down in regards to the amount of chips that are being put down. And this has been adapted by the Asphalt Institute and Asphalt Emulsion Manufacturers Association. So there's a lot of good information out there. And in this day and age, you can just Google up anything. And so if you go out there and you Google up like uh, the chip seals and quality of chip seals, the Asphalt Institute, they've probably got a lot of good things to say if you're wanting to look at various methods of putting a chip seal down. So the chips must be clean. That's really important. And there's, there's, there's testing that can take place to determine the cleanliness of your chip. You typically want less than 2% of your material passing the number 200 sieve. So when we started our conversation earlier, that's, the, that's the, one of the finest sieves in our sieve stack. And it means it's 200 wires per inch. And so we want less than 2% passing that number 200 sieve. So we want some, actually some really nice clean material. Um, cubicle chips are better than flat chips if we can set up the crusher to do them that way. Uh, we want at least two crushed faces because they'll seed a lot better. And so the more single sized the chip is, the better it is. And I was really interested, intrigued by the, by the sand being introduced into the, into the chips. And I would be really interested to know how that is actually working out. So perhaps we can comment later on that. So again, there's the, there's the sieve stack. Um, you know, our, our soils are classified under gravel, sand, silt, and clay. Uh, we want to stay away from clay. We want to stay away from silt. Uh, somebody introduced sand, and, and I would be, again, interested. But mainly that's this gravelly type of, of soil that we're interested in. Uh, the finest sieve down to the bottom is that number 200. So we want to make sure we have a well-graded material. So dirty chips are bad news for us. Greater than 2% passing the sieve is bad news for us. It does impede the ability of the binder to bond that chip to the roadway. So um, also, if we introduce a lot of, a lot of fines in the chips, we do have a, a dust problem uh, that's introduced and it occurs after sweeping. In some areas of the state, uh, Boise being one of them, the dust bothers a lot of people as far as having good air quality. Some of some agencies' funding is sometimes tied to the quality of the air. So we want to glue down that's just a single layer of chips is glued down. We want to have the chips embedded into the asphalt, probably between 60 and 70 percent of the chip. Okay. And it will withstand then the that the wear that traffic puts on it and also the wear that snow plows introduce onto the chips. So 
we need to see the emulsion towards the top of the chips before the emulsion breaks. So which are the better chips? If anybody wants to chat, put into the chat box, top picture or bottom picture. Or don't know. Sorry, I had to unmute. I'm getting some answers that say the top picture. We have one feedback that says we keep our chip piles watered down while loading them. Okay. Well, that's a good idea. Most responses are coming back and saying the top picture. Top picture, yep. The top picture is, is the one because we get a nice uniform aggregate. You can see it's well bedded into the uh, emulsified asphalt. Uh, the bottom picture, you're going to start getting ready and the chips are going to start to come up uh, because they're of various gradation sizes and they just will not stick very well. And yes, that is a good answer too, you know, to water your, water down your chips um, as, as you load them to kind of keep the dust off of them, get them nice and clean. So which asphalt are we interested in using? Do we want to use cutback asphalt or asphalt emulsion? Well, cutbacks, cutbacks have been used, but they're not very popular. You know, cutback is an asphalt that's, that's uh, thinned out by volatiles, and you have to have the volatiles come off to kind of cure out. They're kind of slow to cure sometimes. Uh, asphalt emulsion uses a lesser percentage of asphalt cement, so you might save a little bit of money there. Most people use emulsified asphalt, and I kind of explained earlier that this stuff is manufactured through a colloidal mill. And that's uh, some of the answers in the, uh, the chat box were saying emulsion, so. Yeah, so emulsion is, is the answer of choice. So, so just kind of a, a picture to give you an idea that uh, the average aggregate height, the top picture is, is embedded about 70% of chips. So uh, the binder is, is put down, uh, you know, and, and it covers almost to the top of the chip. And then when the, when the binder, or in this case, the emulsified asphalt cures out, you know, you've got some volume in the form of the water that's going away. And you'll end up with the binder at the height of about 70% of the chip height. So, so again, it's kind of the, that art and science as far as how much asphalt that you spray onto the roadway. We don't get too alarmed if we've got the binder coming close to the top of the chip uh, before curing takes place, but certainly after curing, we get that nice seventy percent embedment. So some of the some of the things to look at, um, uh, we want to make sure that we've got good weather. We don't want want it raining on us. Uh, uh, surface condition is good. Uh, most people uh, have some uh, temperature specification, like the pavement surface needs to be a certain temperature and rising. I've had some people tell me sixty five. I've had some people tell me eighty. So it just kind of depends on how you're operating and, and, and where you're at. Uh, typically, uh, the season for uh, seal coating, it kind of varies all over the map. I know ITD was June 15th to the end of August. Some people will go into September. Um, and again, if we had a, had a chance to kind of chat together in the room, we would find out that, that the, the band of, of season for chipping is usually sometimes you know, right during the summer, it doesn't extend much into the fall at all. We want good traffic control, properly sized aggregate. Uh, we all want to be able to, to have good asphalt and test our asphalt. Somebody mentioned a little earlier that the oil truck driver or the asphalt distributor driver is very key to success of your chip seal, as well as having a good calibrated chip spreader. You want rollers, you don't want to use a steel wheel roller. I've seen somebody do that once, uh, but you want a good pneumatic tire roller so you'll see those chips and then be able to sweep up afterwards to help lessen your liability. So weather and surface conditions, we want a dry surface. You know, if we've got a little bit of a damp surface, might be okay, but dry is preferable. A good temperature, um, 
For rain and humidity, we, we don't really want to put this stuff down in a rainstorm, as I mentioned. Wind will play a factor as far as um, uh, how the asphalt breaks. So if we're putting something down very hot and very windy, we want to take that into account. Okay. Um, so the temperature requirements, kind of a general rule of thumb, most will say that we won't want to put this stuff down before June 1st or after September 1st. Many will come with the rule and say that we want the surface temperature to be 80 degrees and rising, although I've heard some people say that they will start their seal coat operation when the temperature of the surface is 65 degrees and rising. Proper traffic control is critical. Um, we don't want uh, traffic running on, certainly don't want them running on the emulsified asphalt before the chips are applied. Certainly don't want traffic running on a fresh seal coat until it's cured out properly. So. It's really important to pay attention to the traffic so we don't get into any liability situations. Um, so distributors are very important. And let me ask this question. We can probably put something in the chat box. Um, do you guys, those of you who do your own seal coats, do you have your own distributor or do you hire the distributor to come in and shoot the oil for you as part of maybe your contract of purchasing the oil? Got one that says contract out and another one that says they have their own. Okay. It's like a little bit of a combination of hiring out and then having their own. Okay. So those of you who hire out, then you hire out just the distributor and then you do the rest of the operation with all your own equipment, own forces. Somebody said yes. Yeah, okay. yeah, we're seeing some yes responses. Okay. Yeah, so it's kind of it's all over the map as far as owning your own distributor or hiring that out. And it's very important to pay attention to the nozzles, that spray bar height, uh, and the application rate. And any more of these distributors, the newer ones, and, and especially the chip spreaders too, they're pretty sophisticated with their electronics as to how they can put the oil down. And on the spray bars, it'll expand and contract for the width of the roadway. And you get a good operator, it's, that person is worth their weight in gold. And so you wanna make sure that you got a good product temperature going down as well. So just, a, just an idea of the distributor nozzle angle, you certainly want them all to be at the correct angle or the same angle, anywhere between 15 and 30 degrees. You can see in the bottom picture, it's incorrect because you've got nozzles that are out of kilter. They're not all uniform in the, in the way they're, they're, they're um, in, the, in the way that they're angled. And so you want to make sure you, you check that before you put oil down. Because what happens is, is that you, when you get the same angle spray, you know, the fans are all the same width, you get a good application of oil. Here, you'll get different widths in, in the middle here you'll get a, a, some streaking and it'll, it'll cause you a little bit of grief as far as how your chip seal turns out. So the spray bar height, typically the nozzles are about four inches apart, but you can lower and raise the spray bar to where you can get a single coverage, a double coverage or a triple coverage. Uh, some people like, like that triple coverage. And so you can see that the oil comes out and gives you good coverage on the surface of the roadway. You want a really nice even flow. So if the spray bar is too high, you'll get quadruple coverage. <laughs> you'll, get, you'll get streaking that'll happen, is what happens. And you'll get ridges that'll be built into your pavement and it'll kind of give you a, a bad job, lousy looking job that, uh, that uh, will cause you some problems. So triple coverage, basically there's no gaps or ridges. It all comes together very nicely and it will give you some good coverage for the application of your chips. So a, a test shot is desirable. Uh, you can apply the asphalt product for a known distance and width and then calculate the amount of applied asphalt product. And you can then calculate your spread rate. And so you can really kind of get a good idea of how much you're putting down and again, the people who maybe design this stuff, or if you're if you're contracting this out and you come up with a spread rate, don't be afraid to uh, play with that spread rate if you need to, in order to get your chips embedded to that nice seventy percent. 
Product temperature is typically between 140 and 185 degrees. So this emulsified asphalt shows up on the job site in a great big, huge trailer um, from Asphalt City. And it typically is, is running a temperature to begin with about 185, 190, and it'll stay hot for quite a while in the truck. And so you want to be able to check the temperature though, not at the big truck that hauled the asphalt in, but you want to check the temperature at the distributor and how it's coming out. That's, that's crucial to make sure you've got material that's hot enough. So again, I've covered this just a little bit earlier, but emulsified asphalt simply is this nothing more than asphalt cement uh, that is suspended in water and it's combined in globules. Uh, some will put in uh, agents of emulsifying agents to help with this emulsification process, such as soap, that's not necessarily the case in all applications. Uh, but anyway, the emulsified agent may assist in imparting that electrical charge. And this will just kind of help those globules stay together so they won't, they won't separate in suspension. So again, it all comes out in a combined water and asphalt together, then the water comes off and you've got asphalt that's left over. So, Asphalt emulsions are kind of all over the map. There's different grades that you can use. Um, so kind of investigate that, what works best. Uh, this is a popular asphalt emulsion. It's a CRS-2P. Uh, dash P stands for polymerization. So it's got some polymer in it, uh, kind of sticky. It will help develop strength at, in, in hours. It'll cure out real rapidly rather than takes days. And so you can kind of sweep this stuff the same day one of the advantages, especially on that high, high speed roadway and you want to get the loose chips off so you don't have windshield damage or, or paint damage to cars. It does require really clean chips though. So if you use the polymerized, you want to make sure your chips are, are really clean. It does uh, help bleeding. You've got to place the chips within a few minutes of the placement of the emulsified asphalt or binder. So you've got to have the chipper right behind the right behind the distributor, pretty close. But it does eliminate bleeding. Uh, it's got a little bit of a higher softening point that will allow the chips to kind of coalesce and seed into the um, emulsified asphalt itself. But your, your bleeding might be a little bit less. So you can sample if you've got a good quality control program. You, you probably should have some kind of a quality control program to sample your asphalt and have it have it tested to make sure you're, you're buying what you specified, you're getting what you paid for. Uh, certainly, you want to pay attention to the again the nozzles, and then you can you can sample the the asphalt. Usually, a one gallon plastic container with a screwed lid is good, uh, and if it has a wide mouth, the lab guys will like you, and it's easier to work with. So if you, if you don't have some kind of a quality control program and you're kind of wondering, you know, am I getting what I'm paying for? There are laboratories out there that will, will help you um, with this, um, the quality control of your asphalt by testing. Okay. So chippers, uh, we ha I had one guy tell me, and tell me if you think you would agree or disagree with this is they wouldn't really worry about or play around with the application rate of the asphalt, but where they made the differences up or how they, how they calibrated was that they would calibrate the chip spreader as far as the amount of chips being put on the asphalt. So in other words, they would shoot the asphalt at a certain rate and then they would vary their application of chips. It seemed a little backwards to me, but I don't know. Anybody got any thoughts on that? How do you do it? I haven't received any responses yet. Somebody did say not enough oil. They won't stick. Yeah, so, so, so most everybody will, will kind, of, kind of fiddle around with the uh, application of the oil and they'll kind of, once they get the spreader set, they'll, they'll leave the spreader alone. But in this case, this agency kind of did it a little differently. And, I guess there's nothing wrong with that. It just seems a little bit, but, um, a little bit different. So we, we got a, another response to this is we shoot the oil rate depending on road condition. 
and then the, the uh, apply the chips accordingly. Yep, and that's good. That's that's the way most most do it. Um, you know, so you again, it's that art and that science that mixes together. But we want a good uniform application rate with our with our chip spreader. So this one looks like it's got a pretty nice nice rate going down. Make sure that the chipper box is working well. So again, we can do a test shot. We can apply our aggregate for a known distance, um, uh, for a distance and width, and we can calculate the amount of aggregate that's coming down to, to get a handle on the spread rate, if you so desire. So here's just a picture of calibrating the, the chipper. You can see that they've got the magic cloth down there. They'll run over it, uh, drop the chips, and then they'll take the chips and, and weigh them and try to determine some kind of a spread rate. Again, those of you who do this uh, on your own, you've done these probably a lot, but you really don't have to go to this extent to know when you've got good calibration. You know it when you see it. Here it is, the rollers are important. Uh, most, most of the time I see operations where they'll use at least three rollers where you can, because you see gaps between the tires. So you want a good roller pattern that's established. So. Uh, having three rollers, you can keep up with, with the production and also you can get good cheap chip seating. Again, you want to be able to, to look at the weight of the roller and make sure you've got a, got a heavy enough roller and also the speed. I've seen people that operate rollers uh, like they're at the Indianapolis Speedway and they just don't get good seating and they'll have, they'll have problems with their chip seal. Uh, a little bit later on, it'll start coming up on them. So it's just a good idea to be able to check the check that chip embedment and just kind of satisfy yourselves. A lot of people just eyeball it and say, you know, I'm getting good embedment in that 60 and 70 percent range. So factors that will affect the breaking and curing of the emulsified asphalt, and we're almost to the end. I'm sorry, we're going over just a few minutes. Uh, weather conditions will certainly play a big factor. Not only temperature, but humidity, a wind. Um, water absorption, so if you've got really absorptive aggregate, um, that might play a factor about how the, how the emulsified asphalt breaks and cures, uh, the moisture content of the aggregate. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a good idea, to, and, so, and there's nothing wrong with kind of like pre-wetting the chip because you can get it to absorb some moisture and also helps with cleanliness. Uh, if you got, Lousy equipment, mechanical forces, uh, it will not help you at all as far as the asphalt going down. And the surface area and the surface chemistry. And so somebody mentioned a little earlier about the type of, of roadway surface you're putting the asphalt on and you'll adjust accordingly. So if you have a surface that's kind of smooth, maybe exhibiting some bleeding and so on, you might want to use just a little bit less asphalt. So again, it's that art and science mix. So brooming is a good idea. In urban areas, people tend to leave their chip seals down like they do here in the Ada County Highway District. Um, in residential areas, you don't get into so many torque claims. But on high-speed roadways, you want to try to get out there and, and broom, broom the roadway as quickly as you possibly can uh, without destroying your chip seals so you'll cut down on your torque claims. And let's face it, when we get into the seal coat business, we are going to have torque claims. I'm sure that just about everybody would raise their hand and say, I've experienced some kind of dissatisfaction with the public and court claims and broken windshields. But we wanna to try to lessen that as much as we can. So some of the typical problems that seem to crop up would be a, a streaked appearance, and typically the spray bar height, they will um, give us that streaked appearance. So we wanna pay attention to that. Bleeding and flushing, if we've got too much asphalt going down, we can cause a bleed flush. We have, have to get out there and try to blot it in some form or fashion. Um, loss of, of the aggregate off of the surface is always a challenge. Um, so pay attention to the oil content. Bad center line joint uh, can crop up and, and bite us if we're, if we're applying the asphalt and causing a bad center line joint. Uh, if we've got a real tight alignment or steep grades, that could cause a problem. If we've got a heavy tree canopy, a lot of shade, like in a forested region of, of the uh, highway, 
um, that might cause a bit of a problem as far as surface temperature of the roadway and certainly fall weather if we go too late into fall then um, we're getting too cool and we won't get the chips to stick okay so just a few rules of thumb for seal coats we want to make sure again that the pavement is clean make sure that we've gone out and used high quality materials we've gone out and cleaned the clean the roadway, we've done any crack sealing ahead of time, any patching ahead of time. We want to make sure that we have the proper application rate for the asphalt, emulsified asphalt going down, and don't be afraid to play with that application rate if you need to. Um, extra, extra aggregates or fine aggregates can cause failure, so we want a well-graded aggregate. And again, I would love to hear more about the sand being mixed in with the chips and if if you're having good success with that and, and how you do that. That's very interesting to me. Um, and we wanna be able to keep the distance between the chipper and the distributor to a minimum. So we're putting the chips down at the right time before the asphalt breaks and, and starts to cure. And so we wanna be sure and get that down when it's, when it's nice and brown. A few more. Uh, I always advocate a minimum of three rollers. I know everybody doesn't always have all the equipment in the world and to keep the speed at about five miles an hour or less. Although some would say they operate at seven miles an hour and they have no problems. But the whole idea is you get good seeding with the chips uh, and get good compaction before the emulsion has broken and the water starts to come off. And so final sweeping of the roadway, if you can do that as soon as possible, many try to do it on higher speed roadways by the next morning. And remember the deep devil is in the details when it comes to chip sealing and those details count and will determine whether you've got a good uh, job or a not so good job. So there it is. We've talked about pavement maintenance and management. We can all agree that if we do everything properly, that we have longer lasting roads that are ahead for the traveling public. Um, so I have come to the end, Lori. Are there any questions, comments, follow up? Everybody still awake? I think so. <laughs> Got a response says the class was very informative. It was a quiet group this time. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's, you know, the virtual is a bit of a challenge as far as that interaction. Those, but I appreciate everybody who did put their comments in the chat box and, and answered the polling questions. So anyway, the, the whole idea is that pavements are a huge investment, and if we can and if we can look at preserving pavements from that proactive approach, um, you just get longer lasting roads and you're able to manage your roadway network a little bit more effectively. And save I everybody pays taxes and you know. Try to save the poll taxpayer a dollar or two. Any other thoughts or questions before we end? We're just getting a lot of compliments in the chat box that are saying a great class and um, thank you for your time.